especially to be talking as a, a new member of the department. I'm really pleased to um, to be joining us. Okay, this this talk was a bit hard to to pitch actually because um, I know that this is a this is a public talk, um, but I'm assuming most people here are um, archaeological colleagues. So I have kind of pitched it with uh, some understanding of um, of evolution and Neanderthal. So I won't be sort of coming in from a, a very basic level. Um, oh, it's just telling me it's being recorded. I need to click that off. Hang on. There we are. Uh, right. So. Yes, let's go. This is not working now. There we go. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I think one, when we're talking about where where this book comes from and writing about Neanderthals, um, I want to kind of just give a background on my sort of situation and my context to this and there's kind of a nice parallel really in how understanding of human evolution at a really broad sort of time scale has changed from a very linear sort of perspective where um early hominins were sort of just on this road towards us and we were there and that was the destination um, whereas now we i think in general people have a a, a picture of of human evolution is, is much more tangled um, with lots of small streams different populations um, appearing and um, sort of different speeds at which they're moving along and they meet and they they sort of separate and so it's much more like a braided river um, and in fact this is also a very nice uh, metaphor for career pathways <laughs> these days um, so although I began in a very um, sort of traditional academic sense I have not followed a clear um, sort of route way towards uh, towards where uh, I am now with writing this book. Um, so my background is academic um, I've had I, I've been at um, various institutions for uh, my degrees and my training I've had honorary fellowships and I had a postdoc at uh, Bordeaux and I've had collaborations with people but also, there's, there's, always, there's been in the last 10 years or so, I've been working and doing a lot of different other things um, to do with focusing on different kinds of communication, essentially communicating archaeology in different ways to different people and different communities. And I've put a dash line in the middle there because it's not sort of one or the other. I have sort of moved between and through. Um, so that's kind of where my perspective is in writing this book. I I have an academic background, I'm trained in archaeology and specialised in Neanderthals, but for a long time I have been drawn to doing um, sort of communication in different ways. And I also have to sort of give shout outs here to, you know, where this if I go deep back into into my origins as a writer, I have to give a shout out to Jean Owl. I think um, if if many colleagues were honest, then they might um, also say that this book was quite formative for them, especially if you encountered it as a teenager, not just because of some of the eye-opening scenes in it, but because of the depth of detail that this book goes into about Paleolithic life ways, basically. Um, all the different aspects of subsistence and technology and, and trying to imagine societies. And reading that as like a 12 or 13 year old was really something that focused me on an interest I already had in archaeology, but pushing it towards the deep past and the Paleolithic. So that's an important thing in terms of where this book comes from. And it is why I talk about it in the acknowledgements. And that one thing that's really important that's sort of, I mean, Cloud of the Cave Bear is like a 1980s book, but very much 21st century, um, this book would not exist without social media. Um, there are a lot of different thoughts and opinions and debates about, you know, the usefulness or not of things like Twitter for academics. But for me, um, coming out of my postdoc um, in 2015 in France, I stayed there for a couple more years, but um, in order to 
maintain sort of my connections with the academic community and and continue writing and, and doing stuff and um, twitter has been really central and it's where my book contract came from um which i was first discussing with the publisher in 2012 so you know those two things are actually um important factors as well so why did i actually want to write this book um well I'm sure everybody knows this book um, and they've heard of it. Um, I had a little look in it, I can't even remember when it was, a while ago, and I looked in briefly, looked at the bit at Neanderthals and put it down again, because it's it's not um, a book that's really rooted in the archeology. span And when it was written, I think it was already using rather out of date information. But the reason that I'm talking about this book is because it sold millions of copies, you know, and it is showing us as archaeologists that people and as Paleolithic archaeologists that people are have a real hunger to know about this part of our history um, and to have it presented in a way that is going to engage them. Um, so I didn't want to write a book like this. I wanted to write a book that was written by an archaeologist who knows the data, but who also could try to engage people in sort of the, the narrative side of, of history and, and, and deep archaeology. So other books on the, on the Undertales are available, um, but in fact, most of them don't do what, what I've tried to do with Kindred. So the Undertales we discovered is an book, but it's nearly a decade um, old now. So a lot has changed. Um, Svante Parbo's book is, although it's called Neanderthal and it's actually very focused on, on his, his work personally and, and genetics. It's not really about the archaeology of Neanderthals. And similarly, Clive Finneson's book is uh, a lot more recent, um, but it's quite focused on his work and, and particular aspects of Neanderthal sort of behaviour. Whereas what I wanted to do with Kindred and what I hope I have managed to, to do is to write something at a much bigger scale and that would be able to to really give people an account of where we are overall with Neanderthals and really take them into the, the deep sort of knowledge that we have with 21st century archaeology, but not overwhelm them. Um, and also um, allow them to connect emotionally with archaeology, which I think if most of us are um, sort of transparent about why we do archaeology, there is an emotional aspect to it. Um, and other things that are specific to sort of why Neanderthals are interesting and zeitgeisty and everything. Well, it's it's true that for a lot of people, ne Neanderthals are something that spark an interest for them. But the context of human evolution in which they're embedded has really changed um, over the past, you know, few decades. The the amount of different hominins we have, the chronology, um, it can be quite overwhelming for people, I think. And Neanderthals are sort of always there as like this hook that people hang on to. So I wanted to use Neanderthals as a way to sort of access um, a little bit more context for people um, rather than just the same old questions about Neanderthals. Um, I also wanted to help people move away from the persistent sort of ice age, really cold Arctic adapted um, sort of ideas about Neanderthals because as we know as specialists, um, you know, they lived through multiple phases of climate change and they lived during a period um, warmer than. And I wanted to really talk about this other unexpected, you know, the Neanderthal, you don't know, that kind of um, sort of perspective on things. And so I have really tried to do that in the book. And also I wanted to really sort of blow people's minds with how amazing modern archaeology actually is and you know the the lengths that we go to that we have to go to in excavating in recording in analyzing um in order to pull out all the absolutely fascinating detail we can get from what is actually really quite you know a minuscule material record compared to later periods in prehistory never mind more recently so i wanted to you know be able to explain how archaeology works but without it sounding like an explainer i wanted to embed that within the discussion of neanderthals themselves um, 
so that was another aspect I was really trying to to sort of achieve and I think as I said before that the the Neanderthals have been there from the beginning in our journey as sort of a species that's uncovering its own deepest past they were the earliest hominin that we found and in many ways we know them the best um, and you only have to look at how um, illustrations and reconstructions of them have dramatically changed over the past 160 years to see that the the way that as a society we frame them is shifting you know in a feedback cycle with what the archaeology is finding and compared to decades of sort of very um primate like ape like imagery and then in the early 20th century you get ones like this on the on the um on the left um where they basically just look depressed and not very you know happy to even exist um you come right to where we are now and it's it's transformed um neanderthals today in in our visualization of them and and which is you know that's as a literal manifestation of what we think about them they're allowed to smile they're allowed to dream they're allowed to touch each other and embrace and that is uh, that's very new you know and i think that taps in when you see people's reaction to the work of the artist here on the right um tom bjorkland people go wild for his work not just because it's beautiful because it is um but also it is showing a different side than most people have thought about with neanderthals that they had a family life you know um and so i think there is a real desire to know more about Neanderthals from these perspectives. Having said all that, the challenge in writing a book like this is getting it balanced and not going sort of too far down into the archaeology and, you know, getting lost in detail, overwhelming people with um, jargon and stuff. And so I have tried very hard to not do that and this book was like twice the length <laughs> it is now um initially in some of the initial drafts i had I cut a lot out and it's coming from an academic background it is difficult to put aside the the kind of writing that we're trained in where you back up everything you're saying with like all the examples you know about and you can't do that in a book like this and um, you have to be very selective in what you discuss and so this book although i i want it to be definitive in its scope of course it's not definitive in terms of having every example ever every site we know about you know it cannot do that um and it's not trying to do that um i've i've picked things that fascinate me the most um i've picked areas that i know the most about which is why western europe is you know a lot more focused on this i haven't focused on eastern europe because i don't know that record so well um so i hope despite that um being written for primarily it's a popular science book so it's written for people who maybe know a bit about neanderthals or know absolutely nothing but i still hope that it is useful to my colleagues um I, I hope it's useful for teaching i hope it's useful for maybe sort of discussing ideas or bringing together themes and, and things like this so actually trying to sort of balance those two aspects um has been quite difficult um so i, I will say that, that it was very nice not to have to put references <laughs> into the text um, that was that was a relief they, they're, they're online um, so how did i how did i do it how did i sort of go about this um i guess one of the one of the ways that i tried to sort of combine detailed archaeological information um, and really show people you know the the minutiae of, of what goes on on an archaeological site and and what we do with that information and, and then what it tells us um alongside creating a big picture from that data and um, one of the the ways that i i realized i could do this was by talking about um hearths and and fire and obviously fire ties into so many aspects of neanderthal behavior um but if we begin at the hearths at the micro level we can move 
up and outwards um, like like the smoke and um, so what I've done is I've selected um, some uh, really 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 key sites where there's been um, really fantastic advances in in methodologies um, that have allowed us to also advance in our interpretation of Neanderthal pyrotechnology um, so one site here um, uh, this is uh, El Salt in Spain and uh, this is a really nice site because they have fantastically preserved hearths and they've done a lot of work in really exploring the structure of hearths you know how how did this structure form what does it mean that we have a black layer where is the the white layer that we see in other sites it's not here what does that mean um and you know the sort of creating micro histories of of hearths um this picture at the top is actually from a paper that has only come out a couple of days ago, a new paper from that site, um, where they have shown that there is a pit hearth uh, there, which is unusual and exciting. Um, but what I've tried to do in, in the chapter where I, where I do this um, in the book is I move from talking about the hearth themselves and the excavation of them to what thin sections are all about, what we can see with thin sections and different phasing of a hearth's um, use which allows you to then argue for how many times this site might have been used or how long for. Um, then you can look at, you know, the, the really tiny uh, micromorph details of, of what's actually in the different layers in a hearth. Um, and, you know, that can show you how the hearth was used and um, whether the, the ash was raked out and um, all these different aspects of behavior that we can get from tiny, tiny remains. And then if you move out a level, um, with us, you can sort of try to communicate what are quite complicated archaeological methods and ideas. So on the left, we have stratigraphies of hearths um, from El Salt, which by sort of, you know, matching what's vertically connected versus what's horizontally connected and how that stacks up, we can say, well, is there at any point in this site where there were multiple active hearths? Um, and then we can try uh, in other sites this is um abric del pastor uh, also in spain and um, you can address the same question of are there more than one active hearth in any layer by doing refitting and refitting is one of the things i talk about a lot in the book because it's so powerful as an archaeological method and we're all used to using that but for people who are coming fresh to how we do paleolithic archaeology it's something that really resonates they can understand immediately what refitting can do for you um, and when you use refitting to argue um, that most of the time there is no sort of um, evidence for multiple hearths in a layer and that tells you then about the frequency that Neanderthals used a particular place and you can then take that out more broadly in the landscape and compare different sites so it's this kind of like moving between different scales of information that I really wanted to try to do. Um, and this, this shows you sort of the, some of the process of trying to represent this visually. So on the left is my horrible little sketch that I did um, for the artist, um, uh, the scientific artist I was working with, uh, Mark, he was brilliant. And on the right is his much nicer, cleaner interpretation of what I was trying to show um, and essentially it's what I've just been talking about how do you discern the different spatial and chronological relationships between hearths in layers how does that actually work and um, because I talk about it in the text but it's obviously quite complicated for people to understand um, and then this is the other aspect of the book that I wanted really to to have which is the original illustrations that Alison Atkin uh, produced with me um, to show sort of slightly more, um, I guess the, the other ideas I speak about in the book that when as archeologists we excavate hearths, um, they're so full of information and, and data and, and you know, we're really keen to get it all out, but actually we are also sitting right in the place where we know Neanderthals we're right in that same space, albeit separated by time, but you know, tens of millennia, they were right there. And I think that's also sort of quite a powerful idea for people um, to, to sort of have that brought home that, that the presence 
of Neanderthals in the past. It really is right there. Um, and so the work that I did with Alison has been, I think, really important in sort of adding an extra level to the book. And I, I hope um, I hope that it's worked well. And at the same time as well, I have also tapped into to my personal interest in, in fiction and um, and poetry. And at the beginning of each chapter, there is a narrative section and um, sometimes just a poem um which tries to to sort of bring out some of the material that is in that chapter but sort of distill it down into visions or um sensory focuses of you know can we imagine life can we imagine scenes um and and that together with the art for me is you know just as important as the archaeological information i've tried to mesh all of those things um together um however when we talk about stone tools um this is another alison's really lovely illustration stone tools are really difficult for people who are not trained in them um or have never napped themselves um to sort of get their heads around uh the the complexity of what we can say about Neanderthal behaviour. Um, <clears throat> so that was a really challenging chapter to write um, because it's it's the area I have, you know, most trained expertise in and trying not to go off the deep end into, into detail, you know, that was hard. Um, so what I tried to do with that, um, this is one of the illustrations in the book again, was talk about the different kinds of technology, guide people through it, um, but focus really on what it tells us about Neanderthals in terms of how they thought and about their appreciation for um, for choice, about their flexibility, um, about their interest in, in quality of materials um, and also creativity, because that's something, you know, all of those things tend to be the opposite of, of the cliche about Neanderthals that you know, they didn't really think about what they were doing and they did the same thing for like hundreds of thousands of years. We know as Neanderthal specialists that that's not true. Um, but communicating why we know that's not true in terms of the um the artifacts um is difficult. But hopefully, um, although that's probably the the hardest chapter for some people to read, um, hopefully it's it still brings out the narrative um, aspects of refitting is, is really important there as well and um, that we can essentially sort of watch Neanderthal choices um, and so I think I hope that one is is an area that will be useful for people and the similar themes sort of go out into other um, other areas of, of of Neanderthal archaeology, this this idea about choice and a focus on quality and efficiency, and um, and we can see that in the the new sort of vision of Neanderthal subsistence, um, that they could hunt big stuff, they could hunt little stuff, they ate plants, um, and you know bringing all that together to discuss sort of the variety and the diversity of um, of how they lived every day. Uh, that was really important to me because it, it ties into sort of helping people reimagine the worlds that Neanderthals lived in as well, the climates, the landscapes, but also just what they ate every day. And the fact that, you know, what Neanderthals at Pont Naweth in Wales 270,000 years ago were eating is going to be completely different to Neanderthals in Palestine 50,000 years ago. Um, and so I wanted to sort of bring these, this, these threads out. Um, check your time and yeah the other aspects really sort of moving beyond how I try to write the book and sort of the the ideas I guess that um that emerged during the writing process that were interesting for me um is the idea about materiality and the connections between things first of all um in writing the historical side of things, I found it very interesting that there is this, you know, repeated context of 
massive industrialization and even militarism in a lot of the Neanderthal discoveries that we have. Um, so that's one thing that's interesting. This is uh, Scherningen, um, a Neanderthal site uh, that is a, a lignite mine, brown coal mine in Germany. And I just love the fact that the, the archaeological site is literally right beneath this monumental mining machinery is such an amazing juxtaposition. But that site is also very interesting, as um, people, many people listening will know, um, as the place where we have some of the most spectacular uh, examples of Neanderthal organic technology and of their engagement with other materials um, would. And I do in the book, I do sort of tentatively call them carpenters. And I, I don't think that's sort of too far off the mark these days with what with what we know about how they understood wood as a substance, um, that they, they're choosing wood species. We can see that in other places that they're selecting particular woods for the hardness. Um, they're selecting the parts of the tree or, or the branch that they're using at Scherningen and elsewhere. We can see that they are using the bases um, for the tips of, of these uh, tools and these weapons because they're the most robust. And even more than that, um, again, at more than one site, we can see that they're using an offset technique um, for carving where they don't follow the grain specifically, but it's slightly offset because that's going to um uh, be a more sort of robust to to damage and and splitting so all the way through what we see in terms of their woodworking this this idea of um quality and materials is always there and this is one of the digging sticks on the left and also then you've got the intriguing objects from abric uh, romani in spain on the right here this uh, this is a new uh, cast in this amazing site that's preserved with travertine uh, levels that have covered the organic material just like the cast at Pompeii and we have occasional pieces at the bottom this one is still to be fully published um, which looks for all the world like a, a knife uh, made of wood a very strange object but there's other things from there as well platters and stuff and sort of trying to pull together these ideas about um, craftsmanship um, and uh, <coughs> sort of uh, Neanderthals as artisans is something that really started to interest me. And similarly, you look at other materials, you see the same story. Um, this is uh, Le Soir here, and um, these are um, skin working tools. And the more we look at these objects, they're only relatively recently recognized, and we see the same sort of themes of choice that they're choosing particular species from amongst the animals that they're hunting. They're not just using anything around them and they're using the ribs um, consistently. So it's these same themes of Neanderthals as being really interested in the qualities of things. And something else that I guess was coming out of the book um, was an interest in different aspects of the, the organic technologies, not just sort of what they did in terms of the the making of things but so the use of these objects i'm interested in as well um i've, I've written about birch tar before this is alison's beautiful um picture of um of birch tar production there one idea of how it can be done simply in a in a fire um but with with other finds um we also for me i think i start to to wonder about issues of you know specialization in particular skills um not formal specialization anything like that but who was actually making this stuff who was making birch tar the piece at the bottom there is a flake from neumark nord in germany an emian site and that little scrap of stuff on there is um an organic uh, remnant with tannins in oak tannins which pretty strongly points towards some sort of um, leatherworking going on. And then you have this new find on the right, which was this absolutely amazing find that, I, you know, I think some people are still struggling to, you know, believe that. Um, uh, a, a very, very tiny um, reverse twisted piece of twine or thread um, that appears to be made of, um, conifer uh, bark or perhaps um, I wonder if it's root fibers um, but it all of these speak to different levels of skill across such a wide range of materials that I am interested in who's making these and in how these skills and these products affected 
different Neanderthals experience of their lives. Um, and although, you know, we might wish to discuss sex and gender as one way that Neanderthal society might have sort of differentiated itself, craft, I think, is also something we, sh we should be thinking about. And similarly, as I was trying to <laughs> try to write a book that was so, you know, comprehensive and about all the different things that are going on, you, you start to see connections between different aspects of what Neanderthals are up to and what they're interested in. Um, and when I, when I talk about this book, people often are saying, well, you know, Neanderthal art, and I don't like to use that word. I don't really like using the word art for them because I think it, it's so specific in Western understanding of art as something you go and look at. It's like a finished thing. Whereas I think, you know, if, if you look at different art traditions all around the world, often it's more about aesthetics. It's about the production the experience of making or the sharing of the experience and what it happens to it afterwards sometimes can be less important so with sort of those ideas in mind um the sort of interesting patterns in the things neanderthals are doing where we don't always have clear functional sort of explanations or contexts um and sort of if we uh these sort of cases here all connect to each other so at the top we have um the engraving in in the cave floor at gibraltar um very odd by itself seems completely anomalous and, and unique and weird but then next to it we have some pigment um which also has lines on it not hash marks but um it has lines on it that are not to do with eating powder or this idea about mark making um, then below that pigment, you have um, shell of uh, site, um, shell which probably was from food collection, um, but it has pigment on it too. And what's more, it's a mix. It's a, it's a mixed pigment, um, a recipe. Um, so that's an interesting association between shell, which in other contexts, early homo, early homo sapiens, um, you know, we are generally assuming that shells are of some kind of aesthetic interest. And this also has ochre. Then you go to the bottom and you have what for me is like, like a keystone object for understanding Neanderthal aesthetics, which is the fossil shell um, from uh, Grotta Formane in Italy. And this, there's no subsistence explanation here for why you would have a little fossil shell, which came from potentially up to 100 kilometers away. Um, and moreover, it has ochre on it. It has red ochre on the outside, which itself came from about 40 kilometers from the cave. And then that sort of this notion of animal objects being connected with ochre you see it again further to the left you have this eagle talon from Crepina. the eagle talons were already interesting to people because of this sort of persistent uh, suggestion that, that neanderthals are interested in birds beyond subsistence so we do see that in many sites but then new work was done um that for me goes beyond arguments of whether these talons were necklaces i don't think that's well supported but what it turns out they do have on them is pigment and it's a pigment mix again so there's this sort of the theme going around and then um you come up uh, above that and there's no pigment on this this is a piece of hyena bone uh, from uh, le cradel in france but it has extremely clear regularized markings that's nothing to do with butchery um, and that brings us again to markings on stone as a different substance at the top. So for me, abundant connections, although these objects themselves are rare, there are clear conceptual sort of relationships between them. I'm not saying that they are, you know, they were physically connected or the, or the, the makers knew about any of these because patently they didn't. They're separated too much in space and time. But the point is, is that they are little windows onto interesting aesthetic things that Neanderthals were doing and there are connections between them and I think that sort of idea of trying to in you know following Clive Gamble's um, concept of tacking between different evidence it allows us to approach other things that we have in the record that are difficult to deal with um, at the top we have the uh, Brunichel, um 
stalagmite constructions and um, they're circles and around the top there you can see where the orange and the red is on those uh, stalagmite circles in uh, that's burning they are deep in a cave um, far beyond any area that you would want to live in it would have been dark and you can see on the right when you actually look in detail at how those stalagmite rings were constructed there again it's about uh, material qualities they're breaking the stalagmites they're burning them they're selecting them by size and shape and then they are actually almost edging onto architectural constructions in how they're putting these rings together. There are things stacked together, there are pieces stacked multiple levels on top of each other. So how we understand that in terms of what Neanderthals are doing elsewhere, it's very difficult, but it speaks to other aspects of what we know that they are interested in, they're interested in materiality, in quality, and in building and putting things together, which is what we see with composite tools as well. And then at the bottom, um, we have the, the new, well, a couple of years old um, uh, study presenting dates for um, art in Spain, essentially on cave walls. Uh, this one is the, the hand negative and the little arrow there shows the area of calcite that was dated uh, next to it. I know that there is still a lot of debate about the um, the, the methodology and, and the difficulty with dating um, cave art itself in these cases. Um, for me, the jury is still out somewhat on these, but in some ways, it's not that far beyond what we see Neanderthals were doing with all these other aesthetic examples. There's even a potential other site in France that I talk about, um, which although the, the context is not fabulous, um, it does look as if it was a cave that was sealed for a long time um, and deposits had built up and therefore what's inside earlier than that is Neanderthal activity and there are finger flutings and some red pigment on the wall. So that's a less strong case, but it's not that different to doing things with cave walls to putting pigment on the surface. So I don't know, um, creating a single line perhaps or about the entire panel with the ladder at Pasiega, that's not all entirely dated anyway. The handprint, I'm not sure. Um, figurative art, genuinely figurative art, I think would still be shocking for a lot of people, um, but we'll see. And then the other aspect really in the book that started to come out and, and sort of I guess develop my own ideas about what Neanderthals were up to is, um, is mortuary behaviour is what they're up to with the dead. This is a new, uh, the new find from uh, Shanada, which is sure everybody is, you know, waiting with bated breath to hear more about this find and, and see all the lovely detailed analysis that's going to be going on. Um, as a, a particular discovery, it's incredibly important. It's the most recent, the only recent um, in situ body really that has been discovered and that we can use the past two decades worth of, of analytical techniques to really sort of understand how did this body get there um, and, and what can that tell us. And, I, and especially interesting um, when I've been going through all the historical cases of burial and really trying to get back to not sort of the stuff that gets into the, the twice removed accounts of Neanderthal behavior, but what does the original site reports and stuff say? Most of the time, um, many of the places like La Ferrasi, um, where the arguments for pits, they turn out to be uh, natural features, and also arguments for um, stuff in the, uh, associated with the bodies, often that's very problematic. But in this case, um, there is potentially something interesting on that right hand picture. That's the, the hand of this new Shanidar Z, which is sort of bent over like this. And you can see just in front of the finger, there is a lithic. Um, and according to the excavating team, that is unusual for that deposit. Um, it's, a, it's a particularly large piece. So who knows what's going on there, but it's very exciting. But for in terms of trying to tack together and, and come up with different fresh arguments um, for what Neanderthals are doing with the dead, um, I was really interested in how much evidence there is now for 
interactions with the bodies with the body processing um whether or not the bodies are eaten um it's just this pattern of, of intense interest not everywhere um, but but more often than we than we used to believe of of actually taking bodies apart of um of fragmenting them as as uh, as we might say and not only that but the bodies in some cases are being brought back into sort of the the living world they are used as tools on the left here you've got um examples of um pieces of femur from a belgian site which were used uh, to to make tools with okay we see that in other sites too but then intriguingly for me most intriguing is um the skull on the right which is from lacina um and in this case you can see uh on the top of the skull there there's a fragment which has got lots of battering on it and that has also been used as a retoucher uh, for making tools it's extremely unusual like totally unique it's the only piece of skull that's been used as a retoucher from any species in any neanderthal site it has been used despite its unsuitability for tool making everywhere else neanderthals are super picky in general about the kind of thing they they use they will choose leg bones and particular parts of the leg bones sometimes they might have a bit of jaw or something like that but this has been used, I think, with that it was from a hominin. In the rest of the world, there's other butchery marks. And um, that's fascinating. The focus um, on the head and the face, which we know is, is one of the key focuses for social relationships. So that's interesting. And then at another site, you have something else going on. This is Crepina, where again, there's massive evidence of body processing. And we have here um, on the, the frontal bone of the head, um, loads of tiny little cut marks which apparently have nothing to do with with butchery or skinning again it sort of comes back to this sort of connecting themes of, of what they're doing with the different materials and why and i think as as archaeologists you know the the debates over burials or cannibalism and was it because they were starving or not i i think we can sort of also consider other possibilities that are not fixed in the notion that eating a body is a desecration of it or means it's worthless um, in a in a socially meaningful sense um, and you know the the notion that that neanderthal butchery of animals was itself just some sort of functional thing that they had no sort of other investment in i think that's also something we should question if we look at hunter gatherers all over the place the relational understanding of the world for me that makes a lot more sense that neanderthals would have some kind of relational framework for understanding everything because their entire existence in their own groups is all re about relational uh, relational uh, concepts and um, then that they would share a very economic sort of black and white understanding of animals just as calories which is tends to be the way that we discuss the record. So just to finish, the last thing I really wanted to, I guess, achieve with the book was to sort of talk about Neanderthals, talk about the past, really sort of take people back into the past and, you know, in, in the depth of all of the evidence that I talk about, really sort of place them there with Neanderthals. But I also wanted to remind them that the Neanderthals are not vanished. You know, they are they're here with us in uh, most of the people alive on the planet um, and tie that into thinking about, you know, our own futures, not just our past, um, but but where are we going um, as a species? And and just note the fact that, you know, the the success of our own species um, is, you know, frequently talked about in terms in as with Neanderthals as a foil of, of being failures. Um, but look where we are going at the moment. We're headed towards at least um, Eemian, state, Eemian temperatures of 120,000 years ago when temperatures were somewhere two to four degrees warmer. Sea level was seven meters plus higher. Uh, Neanderthals could cope with that. Um, 
we are facing the same thing um, and it's not looking brilliant. So I kind of wanted to use the book really to bring people up hard against that. And this quote at the bottom is fantastic quote from um, William Golding's book, The Inheritors of how the Neanderthals saw Homo sapiens, um, how they envision us. And, you know, that book was written a long time ago. And if anything, you, you, can, you can think of it as being somewhat worse now um, in terms of sort of the biodiversity that we are responsible for um, destroying and losing. Um, and with the book, I wanted to sort of finish with you know a bit of a, a bit of a harsh wake-up call for people um, and I'll finish my talk by just reading you um, this last sort of section of, of my epilogue if I can um, so over the ancient Eurasian steppe superhighway where Neanderthals once trod Pleistocene corpses melt out from vast ice peaks mammoth feet wolf heads entire infant cave lions like some ghastly outriders of doom. The great thaw might even be how we meet Neanderthals for a third encounter, somewhere still ice clenched by 50,000 year old muds and permafrost, a body surely lies. We might console ourselves with the knowledge that Neanderthals survived similar extremes of climate change as glacials expired the land itself must have seemed to disintegrate as old permafrost bubbled up into lake speckled bogs, running horizon to horizon. Hillocks appeared and disappeared like gigantic seasonal fungi. Forests staggered and drowned. Vast craters opened up. Entire mountainsides liquefied like ice cream as soil, plants and everything slid off, despoiling local ecosystems and once lucid rivers. The infrastructure of life ran heavy with sediment as the land was sloughed off all this and they held on but a eurasia with maybe a few hundred thousand souls is very different to today's teeming millions neanderthals could move to try and escape hard times we have no guidebook for the destination our sprawling industrialized imaginally complicated civilization faces what's been shockingly proven by covid19 is that even with technological buffering we are on a course for uncertainty and ever greater instability. This future of blistering sun, suffocating cities, flood, tempest, and maybe more pandemics is like a bison thundering towards us. If we do not move fast, our children's children will be impaled and bleeding from them out onto the ground will be the last Neanderthals. So that's the end of the book. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. That was so good, Becky. Um, can't wait to read it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Shall I okay, stop we'll my screen share? Yeah, if you uh, stop sharing your screen, then there's, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so we'll go on to questions. Um, so um, yeah, you can either write questions in the chat or you can just write sort of me and then we'll uh, invite you to uh, ask a question out loud. So um, Ben Elliott asks, were there specific popular ideas or misunderstandings concerning Neanderthals that you wanted to challenge from the outset of the writing process? Um, I think two things really, um, like I said before, the, the idea that Neanderthals kind of just did the same thing for the entire time they were around. Um, you know, the, the span of time we're talking about is massive, you know, between 40,000 to 350,000 plus years, it's massive. And I wanted to <clears throat> to show people the the diversity of of what they were up to. So it's it's the idea that they were static and unchanging and sort of unsophisticated, um, definitely. And and also just the variety of 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 the worlds that they lived in. That that they were not just sort of all huddling around, you know, um, fires in in desperately cold times. Um, any more questions? Um, right, no, Paige, Helen Page. <laughs> <laughs> so she asked, writing a book about Neanderthals is made challenging by the fact that new sites, science and evidence rolled in so quickly. Can you speak to how that was for you, trying to balance the publication process with the speed of science? I think my editors would probably say 
that 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 was difficult and um, yeah i was i was still putting stuff in in april when i finished the like i submitted the manuscript in june so it was very difficult to um to yeah not be sort of concerned i think I, I, it's obvious when you write a book like this it's going to be technically out of date within a few months in terms of specific new finds but i think i was fairly confident that the overall themes of the book would remain the same bar like the discovery of a neanderthal chauvet then yeah that would have been a bit <laughs> a bit tough to have that come out at the end but um i think overall i got in pretty much everything that that came out just up to the last minute but it was hard <laughs> um james ferguson asked what advice would you offer to current evolutionary anthropology, archaeology undergrads in their final okay. year, especially given the current slash future economic climate due to the pandemic? Um, I think, I think I would say, um, be like a Neanderthal, be flexible and adaptive. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it, 10 years ago when I when my PhD was finishing and I was coming into the postdoc arena it was difficult already um it's clearly very intimidating for people finishing um or even beginning their degrees right now but I think certainly the the interest of of people in archaeology is always there you know that's that's something that culturally there's always room for however you pursue that um, but also to not forget that one of the most precious things that studying um, does is it helps you think critically and that's something that you can take with you wherever you go and whatever you do I think um, so yeah I would say be flexible and, and um, take take a broad view on what you what your skills are about um. So we've got another question. How has your academic colleagues reacted to you writing a book for the public? Has there been any scepticism or mainly appreciation? So far, everybody's been very nice. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that's that's probably one of the, the hardest things about it, that I writing about your own subject that you know so much about um, is difficult in itself because you've got to, you know, pull your head out of that and really, you know, simplify, but also keep the detail. Um, but also yeah I, I i want i want it to be a useful book for colleagues i don't want to get anything wrong you know <laughs> but um but people were great people read chapters and um and so far i've had some lovely emails from you know from colleagues uh, saying how much they they love not just the archaeology but all of the the narrative stuff you know the little stories and things and and that was the most scary thing to reveal that kind of writing so i'm really pleased about that um, Anthony asks, uh, we often see Neanderthals as similar to or different to um, ourselves. Do you think we possess the tools of thought to think and understand Neanderthals in their own terms? Oh, lovely question. Definitely not. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think understanding exactly what Neanderthals thought about the world is just as hard as, you know, like I'm reading another book that came out just um, when mine did, fantastic book about the Vikings and the children of Ash and Elm. It's written by an archeologist and he, there's so many parallels with my book actually in sort of the oddness of the Vikings, of their world and of their cosmology and everything. And, you know, if we have that understanding that the Vikings were really something else, of course Neanderthals are good. <laughs> be something really different but I'd love to know what they think about us for sure. <laughs> um, Izzy asks, do you think we paleoarchaeologists need to be doing more to disseminate our research and engage the general public uh, in the rich narratives of the deep past and if so do you recommend, how, uh, what do you recommend that we do? Um, yeah I do um, I think obviously um, there's a lot of different ways to do that you can write a book like this which is a massive undertaking it took me three years to write that um but there's other things like there are some projects and um, that are really inspirational um in terms of how uh the level of public access to the entire process i think i mean i like to compare sometimes archaeology and astronomy if you look at how nasa presents its data it's all open access they have um 
you know, they make a real effort to reach out and to have public facing um, investigations, to have labs being sort of visible. But some archaeologists are doing that. Um, Lee Berger's uh, projects and the Rising Star projects and other work, you know, they have in the field, they have set it up from the start to share what digging is like. And I think that's one of the things as archaeologists, we can forget very fast what a huge privilege it is to do field work to touch this stuff that nobody else can touch because it's in museums and you have to apply to touch the objects that we just deal with on our digs you know and it doesn't take much to have a webcam set up sometimes to stream it there's a streaming from a viking dig uh, on, a, on a boat boat i think at the moment right now coming from somewhere in scandinavia um, it doesn't take a lot to have videos coming out from your lab as you work, you know, have little scenes, talk to people about what you're doing. I'd love to see more archaeologists do that because I think there's an appetite for it. And at the end of the day, most of us are publicly funded. So it is two o'clock, but we have got some more questions if you're happy to. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to stay. Yeah. That's fine. Um, so Cara said, I downloaded your book on Audible and think it is so impressive that you narrate it as well. So how did that go for you and was it difficult? It was so grueling, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, it was an amazing opportunity and I really wanted to do it. Um, but it was, yeah, it was it was a lot because we had to do it um, during the current situation. There was no studios available here. So Audible literally came and set a studio up in my front room. I had to send my family with my small children <laughs> to the grandparents oh. for nine days. <laughs> Well, we did it and I live in a rural area, but there's a lot of tractors that go past. So we had to stop hundreds of times a day for vehicles to go past, planes to go over. Um, so it was very, very grueling. Um, but it was a fantastic experience and the producer was amazing. I learned so much from her and I also learned, yeah, that that I have a completely different narrating voice to my normal speaking voice. So yeah, it was fantastic. I'm really glad that people like it. <laughs> Okay, so Chris said, I know you think that the extinction of the Neanderthals has maybe been focused on too much, but it doesn't, does raise an issue. It, it's not just the Neanderthals that physically disappeared, but the Nisanensis, Luzanensis, and maybe also Erectus in Indonesia and other populations in Africa. So do you have wider thoughts on the processes involved? Yeah, um, I mean, when I say, you know, people talk about the Antarctic extinction too much, of course, it is a super interesting aspect of them. Um, I like to talk about all the rest of it too, but somebody asked me in a talk the other day, you know, was it our fault and what's going on with all the other species, which is exactly what this question is about. And I think, although where the picture for me seems to be going in, in the, the it's a contextual process and um, certainly for the Neanderthals and um, what we see in one part of their range and at one point in that last sort of thousand years um, between 45 and 40,000 ish it's not going to be the same process everywhere I think there are interesting contradictions as well in terms of sort of the broader evidence for how they are in terms of being societies that are built around sharing of food and things like this that doesn't um, sort of fit with them being inherently violent so i don't think conflict is is a is an assumption that should something else was going on too but yeah the question of why why do we at around 40,000 50,000 40,000 seem to have this late dispersal and at that point all of the others go, or almost all of them. There's something different at that point in our own um, sort of society, I think, um, or society's plural. Um, whatever was happening, I think, was um, definitely qualitatively different to the earlier Homo sapiens um, uh, way of life or social structures or something. Yeah, there's, there's, it is a bit of a coincidence. Um, Ellen says, I know the book relies on the most recent research, but what was your process for getting in, into the creative side of things? The excerpt you read is brilliant. Did you take any courses or read lots of fictional books? It's incredibly difficult after years of academic writing. 
Oh, well, to, <laughs> I think to be honest, this has been like part of me that's been trying to get out for a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I always read a lot of fiction um, as a, you know, as a child, I was like a massive bookish child. And I was like, I started a poetry club at school and things. So, you know, that sort of the creative writing side is, is something I think I realised um, had been not really fed very much in Though I didn't start out with the idea of doing it when I started the, the book and um, it kind of just happened because when I when I read papers um, you know scientific articles some it's very hard for me to not end up with these visual scenes of things you know like with the in the book there's a whole section about the the wild cat that's butchered at Abbot Romani and just it's so visual um, and when I sort of thought actually this is my book I can do that if I want um, that was really freeing and so yeah I I'm really pleased to have been able to sort of put that side of me that was dormant <laughs> um, back out there and have more of a balance. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. Um, would you write another book? Oh, I really want to write another book. Yeah. <laughs> no, I have, I have ideas. I have definite ideas. I'm, I'm talking to agents and yeah. So I'm very much hoping that this is going to be, the way forward. <laughs> um, so I think that's all of the questions. Um, so I guess we'll finish up there. Um, thank you very much, Becky. And we'll see you all next week for, uh, not next week, actually, the week after um, for Chris Stringer's talk. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming and listening. It's been yeah, brilliant. thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs> I can see everyone saying goodbye. <laughs>